Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. Thanks, Pastor Brian. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Dave. I'm the discipleship pastor at Harvest Bible Chapel in Traverse City, and it's been amazing to have a partnership with your church. Um, I got to spend time last night with a bunch of the small group leaders or um, aspiring small group leaders or people whose small group leaders are aspiring that they would become small group leaders. Um, you're not getting kicked out. You're being encouraged to multiply. Um, but it, it's amazing to get to spend that little bit of extra time because it lets me get to know all of you a bit better. It's been just a blessing to be with this church body and see the love and joy that you have in each other. Um, and also just getting to learn things like I hear uh, Pastor Brian makes some awesome broccoli. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can get, get the recipe from him later. Um, but you get to learn... <laughs> um, you get to learn some amazing things about people as you spend some time together. Um, but I realize that puts uh, you all at a disadvantage because you don't really know me. So um, I've got a picture here of my family. Uh, you can see my lovely wife, Kelly, my two girls, Elsie and Lucy. Um, we have them running feral with Grandma and Grandpa today. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, we've been in Traverse City for a couple years. I spent almost all my life in Southeast Michigan. Uh, my family moved to Troy when I was in middle school and I pastored in Dearborn uh, for seven years after being a missionary for a while. Um, and it's just been an awesome opportunity to serve God. But that's kind of the, the life resume end of it, right? And that really doesn't tell you anything about me, right? So um, how about a little bit of a confession, right? Um, I can become obsessive about little things. Like if something is just a little bit off, I can't let it go. So uh, like a few months ago, our team went to a conference together and one of the other pastors uh, nudges me during one of the sessions and says, hey, can I borrow a pen? Now, of course, he should have his own pen. But blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So I can show him mercy and look for a pen. And I, I open up my, my bag and my pen's missing. And it's just a pen, right? I mean, it's a nice pen. My wife got it for me a few years ago for a Father's Day present, but my pen's missing. And so, like, my heart rate starts going, <laughs> and I start rifling through my bag. I can't find my pen. Where is it? And for the next 20 minutes, I'm totally checked out about learning about God's Word because I don't know where my pen is. <laughs> and I start thinking through, okay, when was the last time I wrote with that pen? I felt the sweet, smooth strokes of the pen across the paper when we were at a coffee shop that morning. So maybe it fell in the car on the way there. And so the minute we get out of session, I go out to the car and I'm like putting my fingers through like a TSA agent, right? Checking every single crevice in that car. My pen's missing. And for the entire week there, it was like the first session of the week that my pen was missing. I must have told our team 20 times, hey guys, we should go back to that coffee shop. Do you remember how good that coffee was? I want to go find my pen. And every spare moment, my mind is flitting to, where's my pen? And finally, the last day of the conference, I convince all of us to go back to that coffee shop, and I check my bag one more time, and I find my pen. <laughs> it had somehow worked itself from its pocket into another pocket in my bag. I can become obsessive about little things. And it's not even when something's off. Sometimes it's just because I want something. Like when I decide that I want something, I become obsessed with finding the best thing of that thing. I see Stephen's nodding, right? Like Stephen and I are vibing right now. <laughs> That's cool, all right. Um, but so uh, back in the fall, um, my boots were totally worn through, right? like absolutely destroyed. They weren't high enough quality boots where they could get resold. And I decided I need a new pair of boots. All right, I think Stephen has thorough goods on, right? So uh, you can tell I, I did my research on boots. Did you know there's an entire YouTube channel committed to a guy cutting apart boots and analyzing the internal contents of them? And over the course of a week leading up to when I preached this sermon for our church in Traverse City, I probably consumed 20 hours of boot-related content on this YouTube channel. And there were at least six different times that I went to Kelly and said, Kelly, I know what boots I'm getting. And then I would go and watch more videos about boots. And then I'd be like, okay, no, no, no. Now I know what boots I'm getting, right? Um, I can tell you 
White's Perry Mock Toes, <laughs> right? Um, hand sewn in Spokane, Washington. All right, resolable like four times, and then they'll rebuild the boot for you later. So it's a lifetime investment. <laughs> it was worth it. I can become obsessive about things. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, amen. <laughs> All right. So um, here's the thing. Maybe that's not you. But while I can be particularly obsessive, I think there's a bit of a shared human condition in my obsessiveness. Whatever catches our imagination begins to take us over, begins to control us. And so if something catches your imagination, it's going to drive you for better or for worse. See, I got so caught up in finding my pen while we were away at a conference that I didn't hear what God had for me that week. I mean, sometimes I did when I was able to put it aside, but how many moments did I miss of just relationship with our team when I'm thinking, where's my pen? <laughs> and while my lovely bride was too kind to say it, I'm sure she got quite sick of me telling her, I've decided what kind of boots I'm going to get. <laughs> and I missed a week of enjoyment of my girls and time with my wife because I was obsessed with getting the perfect pair of boots. When our eyes are fixated, fixated on things that are passing, fixated on things that are trivial, we can miss the eternal and meaningful. So I want to ask you today, what are your eyes fixated on? What does your mind run to when it has a moment of quiet? What does your mind go back to moment after moment when you get peace? What gets you excited? Are you so fixated, maybe fixated on keeping your schedule and your plan, that rather than seeing people who interrupt your plan as an invitation to experience the glory of God that he has put upon them, an invitation to love someone who desperately needs it, you see them as an interruption and an obstacle to be overcome because you got a schedule and you got to keep it. Do you find yourself so fixated on the hope of what one day you will become that you are unable to be present in the moment and what God has for you right now? Do you find yourself so fixated on creating comfort and getting stuff that all of your time and relationships are simply a means to attaining a better end. Whatever the eyes of our hearts fixate upon will control our actions and our attitudes. And while the wrong fixations can blind us to what is most beautiful and meaningful in this life, the axiom cuts both ways. When we fixate our eyes upon that which is most meaningful and good, it illuminates the threads of glory and beauty that God has woven into creation so we can see his hand at work among us. That's where our text is going today. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. I want to invite you to turn there with me. I'll say it again because not everyone always listens when the pastor gets talking. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. And we find ourselves at this point in chapter 5, that's really a conclusion to an argument that Paul has been making beginning in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And it all goes back to this idea that what our eyes fixate upon will change us. You see, back in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul argues that as we behold the glory of God, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. When our eyes are fixated upon Jesus, it changes us. As we go into chapter 4, the Apostle Paul then argues when we love the gospel, it causes us to proclaim it with boldness. And even when we experience persecution because of proclaiming that gospel with boldness, 
we do not lose heart because our eyes are fixated upon Jesus. As we move into the beginning of chapter 5, we see that when we love the hope of heaven and our eyes are fixated upon where we are going with God, we can live with good courage because we know the end of the story. In our text today, Paul wraps up this argument that whatever the eyes of our heart fixate upon will shape us and control our actions. He actually gives us this final hook upon which we can hang all of our Christian actions and ethics. One thing that is strong enough to define everything in your life. You ready to find out what it is? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11 it says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Did you catch it, church? The one thing that is strong enough to bear the weight of all Christian ethics and actions. It is the love of Christ. See, divine love demands a response. Divine love demands a response from us. If you were to take the Apostle Paul aside and say, Paul, why do you do what you do? What makes you who you are? are he would answer by quoting himself probably from second corinthians chapter 5 verse 14a the love of christ controls me it controls me divine love demands a response i cannot help it because my eyes are fixated upon the love of jesus Now, depending on the translation you have in front of you today, that word controls might be translated differently. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It's one of several actually solid English translations, something for which we should be very grateful. Rather than fighting about which translation we prefer, we should be grateful that there are like dozens of English Bible translations that we get to tap into. Because sometimes there's nuance in a language that we don't speak that is communicated better when we can read these translations in parallel. And we struggle to grasp this word that we translate controls because it really has two senses in the original language that no single English word captures. So depending on the translation you have, you might, instead of the word control, have the word compels us. You might have the word it constrains us. You might have the word it impels us. All because translators are trying to get at this idea of the original Greek word here. How does the love of Christ form and shape us? And it has these two senses. One is that it hems you in. It hems you in. That's where we get the word constrained as a translation. The other is that it pushes you forward. That's where we get the word impels in a translation. And so the divine love of God, it will constrain you, it will hem you in, and it will push you forward in your life. And so what does it mean that love can push us forward? Well, if we look at 2 Corinthians 5, we look back to the Apostle Paul just one verse earlier from our passage today in verse 10. He talks about his excitement, his anxious hope and expectation to come before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, 
That is not often how we think about the judgment seat of Christ. When we think of a judgment seat, most of us feel a little bit nervous. Why is Paul excited for that day where he will stand to be judged before God? There is, of course, knowing that Jesus has covered his sin and that is a wonderful truth that he gets to rest in, but that doesn't make you excited. It doesn't make you excited to stand before the judgment. That's already completed. His excitement is that he is going to burst across the finish line of his life and he's going to meet the Savior who loves him. He's going to get to be with him and enjoy him and what he has as a taste in this life. He will know as a feast in eternity to be with Jesus, the one who loved him and loves him infinitely. A hope laid out before him that is worthy of his life. When we love someone, it pushes us forward. Now, I'm going to refer to Kelly a lot today because we're talking about love and the best way we can talk about love in human terms, I think, is the love between a husband and wife. So deal with it. But if you know my wife, you know she loves her father. Her dad has had an amazing role in her life. In high school, she ran cross country. And at her last race as a senior in high school, her coach hands to all of the seniors a Sharpie. And he tells them, write in your shoe the name of the person for whom you're going to run your last ever competitive race. She put her dad's name in her shoe. And then she goes out and she runs a race on a miserable cross-country course. But she keeps going because she's running it for her dad. And she crosses that finish line and she runs into his arms and she gives him a hug and she pulls off her shoe, which would have been a weird thing to do, except for the fact that his name's inside of it. And she says, Dad, I ran the race for you. And he starts crying, and she starts crying, and they're hugging each other, and it's this beautiful moment together. And what mattered at that moment was not the place she finished in. See, she wasn't the fastest one, one to run. It's difficult to say. She wasn't the fastest one to run that race. Her dad didn't say, you should have tried harder. <laughs> what mattered in that moment was the fact that she had run the race for him. And it was an expression of her love for him that pushed her on. And they felt that joy because it was a race that was impelled by love. Our love for Jesus should push us on in the race we run in this life but it doesn't just push us on. It also hems us in. Being hemmed in by love means your response to a situation is predetermined by who you are as someone who is loved by God. Let me say that again because it's a bit of a longer sentence, right? Being hemmed in by divine love means that your response in a situation is predetermined by who you are as someone who is loved by God. God. When you get to know someone well enough, you can begin to predict how they're going to respond in certain situations. You know you put someone in a situation and this is what's coming out the other side. Now, um, I'm a Lions fan. Uh, <laughs> apparently that's not too resonant here. <laughs> I would have thought we were close enough to Detroit here. <laughs> My goodness. Anyway, I'm a Lions fan. Maybe you aren't, but that's okay. This season was the best season of my life to be a Lions fan. It was amazing. Week after week to see the Lions succeed? <laughs> I mean, I have watched nearly every snap of Lions football since I was like seven years old. And when they were succeeding, you didn't have to tell me to stand up and cheer. You didn't have to tell me to read articles about the Lions during the middle of the week. 
You didn't have to tell me to go and talk to my friends about how the Lions had done that week. I did it because I'm a Lions fan. And when the Lions are successful, my response is predetermined by my love for a team that has hurt me so often. <laughs> Which also meant that every moment in this season, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. At no point was I like, you know what, we got this. Super Bowl, here we come. Because I have 30 plus years of pain <laughs> that have been ingrained in me as a Lions fan. And you don't tell me to worry that they're going to fail. It just happens. <laughs> it is hemmed in. It is who I am. I'm constrained by my identity as a Lions fan in an abusive relationship with my team. <laughs> if you love the Lions, you know what I'm talking about. We're hemmed in. It's who we are. This is what I mean when I say divine love demands a response. There is a response that we take, but it's almost an inevitability. Of course, we make the choices to respond in that way, but there is this power of love that is pushing us on and hemming us in to make us into something new. The love of God is forming us. So how does the love of God push us on? How does the love of God hem us in? When we look at our text today, we'll see first that the response that divine love creates is a love for God. We respond to God's love with love for God. Consider for a moment in verse 13. Paul writes, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Now that translation of beside ourselves is a little bit gentle for Paul's language. If we were to be a bit more bold in our translation, we would write, if we are out of our ever-loving minds, it is for God. If you think I'm insane, I'm insane for Jesus. I am willing to look like a fool because I love God and God loves me. And ultimately, your judgment of me as a fool is inconsequential because I'm loved by God and I love him desperately. In fact, this was a charge that the Apostle Paul is responding to in the church in Corinth. See, after Paul had planted the church, he then went on to continue his missionary journey. And all sorts of wild stuff was happening in Corinth. I'm not going to get into all of it today. Read 1 Corinthians and you'll be like, that's a church? And you'll be so grateful for the church that you're in. Actually, I think we should have that discipline of reading 1 Corinthians and comparing our church to it every so often just so we can be grateful. But he began facing these charges as he was separated from that church. And people began to say things like, do you really want to follow a guy who gets beaten in every city that he goes to? I mean, that doesn't sound like a great plan for a flourishing life. Go somewhere, talk about Jesus, get the snot beaten out of you, and then go to the next city and repeat the cycle again. That is not the gospel we often preach. And they said, why would you follow this man? And they said, look at what he says it commands of your life. The, the gospel, according to Paul, ought to shape our entire lives. Do you really want to give up all that you are? I'll preach to you a gospel that asks for just a little bit. Rather than all of you. Paul is out of his mind. What kind of man, time and again, goes from city to city, getting beaten, living poor, getting shipwrecked. He gives a list of all the things he's gone through in 2 Corinthians. What kind of man does that? He's clearly a sociopath. You don't want to follow Paul. Follow us instead. And Paul is saying, you know what? By human standards, you may consider me out of my mind. And I'm okay with that. If I'm out of my mind, it's for Jesus. 
He loves me, I love him, and love makes fools of us. When I started dating my wife, I took her on seven dates in seven days. It's not like I set off with this plan of, I need to take her on a date every single day this week. It's just, why would I ever choose not to take Kelly on a date? I have a night, she has a night, we're in college. What's money for? That's what debt's for. We'll take care of that later. It got to the point where one of my friends pulls me aside and is like, Dave, you got to stop taking Kelly on dates. You're making me look bad. <laughs> he was dating Kelly's roommate at the time, and he didn't want to have to take his girlfriend on a date every night. Eventually, my wallet caught up to me, and I had to stop taking her on dates. But love makes fools of us. I didn't care what Nathan thought. I cared what Kelly thought. Paul and his companions had been met by God with love. And that love changed them. In verse 14, Paul describes this love that changed them. He says, for the love of Christ controls us because... Why does the love control us? Because we have concluded this. Because we know this to be true about God and what he has done. That one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. Church, in love, Jesus died for you. In love, Jesus saw you, saw you personally, and said, I know you. I know who you are in your inward being. I knit you together. I know all of the glory that I put upon you, but I also know all of the horrible scars that sin has left upon that glory. I know what you deserve. That your sin deserves death. But I love you too much to leave you to it. And he looked across the span of time and space and saw you. And in love, he took on flesh. He came for you. And he dwelt among us. And he said, teaching you is not enough because there's a penalty you owe, a judgment you owe, and I'm going to pay it. And I'm going to die so that in my death, you would experience life. I'm going to die so you don't have to be separated from me forever. I'm going to die to bring you back into the family. I'm going to die because I love you. He saw you trapped in the bondage of sin, unable to walk freely, unable to live as he has made you to live in this world. He saw you trapped in your temptation and said, this is not what I intended for you. I've made a better life full of hope and joy in me. And I'm going to die so that power of sin that holds you captive would be broken. But his love doesn't end there. It continues on in verse 15. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Jesus didn't just love you enough to restore you to neutral. Jesus loved you enough to empower a new life in you, to give you a new purpose, to send you out on his mission to change this world, 
to say you have a life that is about nothing more than fulfilling your menial desires, and yet I want to invite you into the story of recreating the broken world. And I'm going to empower you to go out from this moment and proclaim love and hope and joy in a world that has nothing more than power that it's fighting against each other with. And rather than fighting over crumbs, you sit at the table and you invite others into the feast. He invites us into a new life. This is a love that compels us. Do you know it? Can you with Paul say, I have concluded this? If not, you will not be shaped by the love of Christ. Love accords with reality. This is the truth of how much God has loved you. And if we truly, deeply believe that we are fully known and truly loved by Jesus to the extent that he died on the cross to save us and empowers a new life in relationship with him today, it'll form us and shape us and cause us to love him. Divine love hems us in. It gives us a new identity. I am loved. I am loved deeply. If you are in Christ, you are loved. You are loved deeply. And nothing that happens in this world will change that fact. So I'm not desperate for love. I'm not afraid of what will happen when I'm controlled by his love. I don't live codependent in my relationships, needing to control how other people feel so I can be okay. I don't need to seek an identity in something else in this life. I have an identity in Jesus. The love of Jesus on the cross not only hems me in, but it pushes me on. I want to be with him. I want to spend time with him and enjoy him for eternity. If someone loves you that much, how can you not? And I want to live to please him. I want to live for his joy. And in living to please him, it will change how I relate to others. And this is the second response that divine love demands. We respond to God's love with love for others. We respond to God's love with love for others. Look again at verse 14. The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. You see, the conclusion that shapes the Apostle Paul is not just a personal one. It would have been just as easy for Paul to write that one has died for me, therefore I have died. It would have been an equally as true statement that would have been equally as formative in Paul's love for God. But Paul is looking beyond himself. You see, Jesus died for my sins, and I can't make his death less than that, but he didn't just die for my sins. He died for yours. He loved you enough to die for your sins, and that ought to change the way I think about you. Because if the one I love most in this world loves you, I don't really have an option. (laughs) The love of Christ should cause us to see other believers differently. Of course, the love of Christ is personal, but we cannot simply personalize it. We need to understand how the love of Christ operates in the church. And so that's why the second half of verse 13 After he says, if I'm out of my mind, it's for God. He says, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. So I want to ask you, church, in what sense can your life be said to be for the good of other believers? (laughs) What rhythms exist in your life 
that are only there because they're for the good of other believers. When was the last time that you were simply compelled by love to serve another Christian, another member of this church family? In what sense can your life be said to be for the good of the church? The love of Christ ought to form us. But it's not only for the good of other believers. You see, in verse 11, Paul writes, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Because Jesus died for people who don't know him yet, the Apostle Paul commits his life to persuading others to know and love Jesus. Now note, the Apostle Paul doesn't write, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to live a good life and hope that someone asks us about Jesus. He doesn't write, knowing the fear of the Lord, we seek to just love other people into the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't write, knowing the fear of the Lord, I pray for my neighbors day upon day. When was the last time you tried to persuade someone that Jesus loved them? Not just said, hey, here's my thought. I'm just putting it out there. Or this is what matters to me. But really, genuinely tried to persuade them because it mattered to you. That they know that Jesus loves them. Well, my little girls want dessert. They have all of their powers of persuasion devoted to that moment. Do we love people enough to actually try to persuade them that Jesus loves them? And to be willing to deal with the consequences of them telling us we're out of our minds? When we're controlled by God's love, it shapes us. Divine love demands a response. So let's think about this in terms of some real-world examples. How would your life look different if it was pushed on and hemmed in by the love of Christ? Well, I think time with God goes from being an obligation to an invitation. My wife and I, we try to get date nights less often than we would like, but when those date nights come up, I'm excited for those. It's not like an, oh, I got to take Kelly out for dinner tonight. I get to go on a date with the person I love most in this world. I get to spend several hours of uninterrupted time seeing how she's doing without a kid saying, I don't want to finish eating this. It's a wonderful thing. And I look forward to it with excitement. I plan around it. I seek it out because I love Kelly. Why would our time with God be any different? Do you believe when you open up your Bible, when you listen to a sermon, that you're actually engaging with God? That you're sitting down at the table with him, hearing from him, experiencing his grace, engaging with his goodness. Set a meal with Jesus and enjoy his presence. If we love him, it will change the way we think about time spent with him. But it will also change the way we approach Christian community. I mentioned I was a small group leader last night. You all have a great group of small group leaders here. Our approach to small group will change drastically if we're controlled by the love of Jesus. Small group doesn't become something that I will make it out to if I don't have something better. It won't become something that I check out from for a season if my kids are in sports. Listen, your kid's probably great, but they're also probably not going to be a professional. <laughs> this isn't my church. I can say things like that. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. small group, Christian community, wouldn't it become something that we add on and try to make it to. It would become the thing around which we organize our lives. 
So rather than saying, I can't make it to small group tonight because something came up, we're telling our friends, I'm sorry, I get to be with God's people tonight. I would love for you to come with me. But I need to be here because I get to be with Jesus. If we are hemmed in and pushed on by the love of Christ, when someone else has a need, that need isn't a burden. It's an opportunity to step into God's love, to actually participate in someone else experiencing the fact that God loves them. For you to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a real sense. For someone, when they touch your hand as you help them, for them to be touching the hand of their Savior. Because you're communicating not your love, but God. If we are hemmed in and pushed on by the love of Jesus, the people we meet become more than background players in our life. But we desire the opportunity to become a background character in their story as they run on toward Jesus in heaven. God's love changes people. And it will move through changed people to change their world. God has a plan for Richmond, Michigan. And it involves his love moving through you to change this town for his glory. God's love will change us, but that doesn't mean that life suddenly is all rosy and perfect. Paul experienced some serious obstacles in his journey with Jesus. He experienced some serious obstacles precisely because he was controlled by love. You will too. But there is strength to persevere that we find in God's love. Because in God's love, we find a secure identity that empowers a consistent response to him and to others. God's love creates a secure identity. See, if you're charting the flow of Paul's thought in these five verses, there's this digression that he jumps into. In verse 11, he says, But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. So he starts off by saying, We persuade others, and then the natural flow of thought that then picks up is because we're controlled by the love of Christ. And yet he jumps into this digression in verse 11. What we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, and not what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. In this digression of thought that the Apostle Paul engages in right here, he's essentially laying out two approaches to life. One that's driven by a pursuit of horizontal love, and one that's defined by a security of vertical love. And so on the one hand, you have those who boast about outward appearance to win the approval of other people. Pastors can do this. Look at my great preaching. Look at the size of my church. Look at all the ways that I've served God. That's what was happening in the church. But it's not just pastors who do this. We will find ourselves chasing identity markers. Trying to find ways to convince other people to love us. Constructing a mask some facsimile version of myself that I think will be most appealing to you. And when I meet you, I put on that mask and I do my best to make it look real. And it's a reflection of the person I think you want to see. But living life that way is so difficult. It's so tiring. It is so defined by anxiety because at some point that mask is going to wear down, a crack will appear in it, and you will see that I am not the person I pretend to be. 
And then what? If what you loved was the mask and not me, you won't love me. How often do we live our lives chasing the approval of others? Trying to create a version of ourselves that we think is lovable. And it ends up destroying us. This is the world we live in when it is defined by nothing more than the pursuit of horizontal love. But there is an option for a different way of living. A life that is defined by a secure vertical love. Listen, if I'm loved by God, I can leave today and all of you can hate me and I'm still good. I may not like the fact, it might be uncomfortable, we might have some difficult conversations. But if the God of the universe looks at me in love, what does your opinion matter? Don't take that as offense. My opinion doesn't matter anymore. (laughs) The opinion of someone who loves you is so much more powerful than the opinion of a stranger. And yet we find ourselves chasing the opinions of strangers rather than living secure in the love of Jesus. When you are loved by someone, Their love gives you a unique strength. Kelly's love of me and belief in me can keep me going. There was a time in my life where I cared about being a good-looking guy. Frankly, I don't care if you all think I'm ugly. (laughs) She likes me, and I'm good with that. But love can also hurt. I've seen the impact of pain when a foolish word or a word of anger has hurt the woman I love. And because our human love goes up and down, we struggle to grasp the security and strength of the unflinching love of God that is ever consistent and ever good. You are loved by God. is the bottom line church God loves you is his love enough for you is it amen and right here right now it's easy for us to say it's enough for me But then we go out into the world where we are experiencing the judgments of hundreds of people around us who all have opinions on how we ought to live our life. And it's in that moment that we have to ask the question, is his love enough for me? Is it hemming me in and pushing me on to say it's still enough? If you are in Christ, he sees you with the joy of a proud father looking on as his child grows. You have his affirmation. So why does it matter what someone else says about you? Divine love demands a response. But we sometimes find our response to God muted by the opinions of others. We find ourselves more concerned with how our neighbor sees us than with how Jesus sees us. Christian, you are loved by God crossed eternity, took on flesh, suffered hunger and homelessness, was abused and killed by the people he created because he loves you. Do not live in fear. Abandon your mask. Know who you are. You are loved. So you don't have to seek approval. You have it in the work of Jesus. Let's live as people who are perfectly loved because we 
are. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. It's not because of what we deserve. It's not because of what we've done. But you love us simply because you are magnificent. And we have your approval simply because you are excellent. God, may we see your love as more true, more real, more powerful, more beautiful than anything else we experience in this life. God, we confess that so often we have swallowed the false hope of the visible rather than setting our eyes upon you, the eternal. God, make us people defined by your love so that as we are changed by your glory in us, the world might be changed around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.